Welcome to Rooted Fellowship. It's a privilege to gather here with you today. My name is Nompumele Lomohotwane and I will be your host for today. That means that I will be helping us navigate through this gathering. At Rooted, we are about three things, um, being gospel-centered, disciple-making and transcultural. These are the three things we want to be known for. If you want to find out more about this, you can head over to our website at www.rootedfellowship.com. At this stage, I would like to invite us to turn to worship. The following song is Somlandela, and it is about how we will follow Christ. I will read for us John chapter 8, verse 12, and it reads, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We are a praying church, we value prayer, and so we would encourage you to pray with your city group, with those around you, with your discipleship group, or to share your prayer requests with community at rootedfellowship.com. We are also a giving church. Um, we would ask you to prayerfully consider giving to the church in numerous formats, that is with your time, talents, or treasures. But we also understand that a lot of us are going through really hard times. So if you do need help at this time, again, I'd encourage you to reach out to the church community 
through your city group or discipleship groups. But if you're not plugged into one of those platforms, you can again reach out to the church. Same email address, community at wefedfellowship.com. We, at this stage, uh, are going to transition to the sermon. Um, we are in the book of Mark. Um, we pray that um, the sermon be a blessing to all of us. Liam Ochetswe, Momo Hai, Siana Mogela, Rooted Digital. Welcome Bay on Yakak and welcome to church. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is John Otarop, and I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship under the leadership of our lead pastor, Oni Mokhatle, who is currently away on sabbatical. And so our prayers are still very much with him and his family. If you've been tracking with us for the last little while, you'd remember that we are journeying through Mark's gospel. And we've been doing so for just shy of a year now, if you can believe it. And as we've been preaching through this fast-paced, action-packed blockbuster of a gospel account, we have broken up our preaching blocks into a number of series. And so we are currently in series three, and we are about two-thirds of the way through the New Testament book of Mark. Today, I'm going to be preaching from Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 31, and I'll be using the Christian Standard Bible, or CSB. That's Mark chapter 10, verses 31. And so you're welcome to either meet me there in your own Bible. Alternatively, you can follow along on screen. That's Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 31. The question of divorce. He sets out from there and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Then crowds converged on him again, and as was his custom, he taught them again. Some Pharisees came to test him, asking him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He replied to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. But Jesus told them, He wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your hearts. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples questioned him about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Also, if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Blessing the children. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of, of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. After, making the, after taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. The rich young ruler. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him and asked him, Good teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving, because he had many possessions. Possessions in the kingdom. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, saying to one another, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, With man it's impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. 
Peter began to tell him, look, look, we have left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy Father, we, we acknowledge and come before you today that you are God over everything. We thank you that you are our Father. We thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world so that we may have a relationship with you through faith and trust in him. We thank you that he made a way for us to know you by dying on a cross for us. We praise you, Jesus, for this. We come before you now and, and ask Holy Spirit that you would lead us in this time. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to the things that you would want us to know. Open our eyes to the things you'd, you'd want to convict us of, to challenge us with, Lord God, but also to comfort us with. We pray that your, your word today, your message, uh, would be loud and clear to us, that you would meet us exactly where we are. And we thank you, Lord, that we can ask this in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen and amen. Now, you may recall that in the first eight chapters of Mark, we were learning about what Jesus was doing that revealed more and more of who he was. And in the beginning of chapter 9, Jesus reveals himself to be the Messiah King who has arrived to usher in the kingdom of God. And he is revealed to be God's beloved son at the transfiguration. But family, Jesus reveals himself to be a different type of king, an unexpected king, a servant king, a king who did not come to be served, but instead he is King Jesus, the one who has come to give up his life as a ransom for all who would put their faith and trust in him. And then towards the end of chapter 9, and now in chapter 10, we are going to learn more about some of the implications for the followers of this servant king. We're going to see how, how putting one's faith and trust in Jesus and becoming a disciple or a follower of this Jesus affects many areas of a Christian's life. Last week, we had the privilege of Dr. Batanai Manika, head of academics at the South African Theological Seminary, uh, we had the privilege of him taking us through how following the servant King Jesus affects our generosity, our unity, our holiness, and our love for others. And this week, I'm going to be diving into how this text, Mark 10 verses 1 to 31, reveals that following the servant King Jesus affects his followers' view of marriage. It influences our attitude to children. It has implications for how we view material possessions. And finally, it alters our approach to position, status, and standing. And so let's begin where this passage begins, um, where we see that following the servant King Jesus affects his followers' view of marriage. Mark 10, I'm going to read that again. Mark 10, verse 1 to 12. He set out from there and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Then crowds converged on him again, and as was his custom, he taught them again. Some Pharisees came to test him, asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He replied to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. But Jesus told them, He wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your hearts. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Verse 10, when they were in the house again, the disciples questioned him about this matter. He said to them, yes, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Also, also if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so once again, in this text, uh, as we've seen in the Gospel of Mark, we have the Pharisees testing Jesus by asking what they believe is a tricky question. The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus because if Jesus supported divorce, well, then he would be upholding their position on divorce, and they doubted he would do that. But more importantly, if Jesus opposes divorce, he may have incurred the wrath of Herod, and, and that it is ultimately, uh, that's exactly what they wanted. That's exactly what the Pharisees wanted. 
You see, the Pharisees viewed divorce merely as a legal issue and not a deeply spiritual one. And therefore, they ask a question, hoping to get Jesus to answer something that would get him condemned. You see, they're currently in the region of Judea, the very same place where John the Baptist was preaching against King Herod's adultery. And this preaching resulted in John the Baptist being killed for speaking out against King Herod and his adultery. And so in asking a question about divorce, the Pharisees are hoping to stir up Herod's anger so that he would kill Jesus, much like he had killed John the Baptist. But what does our servant King Jesus do? He wisely answers this trick question, as he very often did, with another question. And he asked them about what the law of Moses, or the Jewish law, said about divorce in Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. Now, Jesus knew what this law said. It said that if a man wanted to divorce his wife, he would need to write out a certificate of divorce. And so the Pharisees duly respond with this answer, verse 4 of chapter 10. But in doing so, they... They expose their selfish motives as they quote Moses out of context. Verse 4, they said, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. And so Jesus then shows these legalistic religious Pharisees just how superficial their knowledge was. And he explains in verse 5 that Moses had to write this divorce law because men were seeking to separate what God had joined together because their hearts were hardened against God and against their wives. And so this certificate of allowance was actually granted by Moses to protect the rights of women and to protect them against adultery, because without the certificate, it left them without many legal rights or the ability to remarry. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel account, in Matthew 19 verse 8, Jesus says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. In other words, this is not what God had originally intended for his people. God makes this allowance because of men's hardened hearts and in order for women whose husbands had committed adultery to actually be protected. Because without it, it left them without many legal rights or the ability to remarry. But this was not God's original design. So Jesus goes on to talk about God's original design for marriage, verses 6 to 9. Jesus describes how God made men and women by quoting Genesis 1.27, saying that God had said that when a man and woman get married, they leave their parents and join together as a husband and wife and become one flesh. And then family, verses 10 to 12, Jesus drops a new teaching with his disciples. You see, according to the Pharisees and the Jewish custom, only a woman was considered to commit adultery. And so if a man went off with another woman, legally it was not considered adultery. But we can see clearly that this was not God's original design for marriage. And it was clearly a perversion of Moses' allowance for divorce in Deuteronomy 24. Clearly, men and women were not being treated equally. But now... According to Jesus' teaching in these verses, a man is clearly guilty of adultery if he goes off with another woman. In fact, Jesus teaches that, that uh, here in this, these verses that if a husband fills out a divorce certificate, even before he commits adultery, he is still guilty of adultery in God's eyes. Now, as a church, we have a position on divorce, which essentially says that where one party commits adultery, abandonment, which includes abuse, Or if there is ongoing, unrepentant sexual immorality, then divorce is permissible. So where one party commits adultery, abandonment, which includes abuse, or there is ongoing, unrepentant sexual immorality, then divorce is permissible. And so family, if you have any questions regarding this, or perhaps you want some more information on this, then I invite you to go listen to Pastor Onia's sermon on divorce in our 1 Corinthians Messy Grace series from 2017. It's available on our podcast channels, um, but for the purposes of time today, I'm not going to re- revisit that in entirely. But suffice it to say that Matthew 5, 32 and 19, 9, uh, in those verses, Jesus says that divorce is permissible where one party has committed adultery, in which case the other party is then free to marry again. But family, do not miss it. Divorce was not God's intended design for his people. It was not his intended design for his people. And so Christian brother and sister, how does your marriage look? 
What is the state of your marriage? Does it look different to this world and the prevailing marriage culture of our times? Does it reflect something of God's original design? Does it reflect the image of Christ and his bride, the church? If you're married, have you hardened your heart towards your spouse and towards God? If you're single, how are you thinking about marriage? Do you find yourself idolizing it and seeing it as a fix-all solution, believing that everything will be completely smooth sailing once you get married? Or perhaps, Christian brother or sister, you've had your heart broken through divorce. To you, I say, Jesus sees you. He sees your pain. He unconditionally loves you. His forgiveness covers you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And although divorce was not part of God's design for marriage, he is currently making all things work together for your good. But to all believers, today I ask, do the ways we think about and talk about and engage in marriage reflect something of the goodness of God and Christ's unconditional, unwavering love for his bride? the church. Family divorce is agonizing and heartbreaking, and it was never God's intention that a wife should ever be divorced from her husband, or vice versa. Here in these 12 verses, the Pharisees come to Jesus trying to trick him as they ask him about divorce. But Jesus flips it, and instead he uses the opportunity to talk to his true followers not about divorce, but instead about true marriage. Following Jesus means that Christians have an extremely high view of marriage. That it is sacred and holy and only comes second to our faith in and love of Jesus Christ. We move on to verses 13 to 16, blessing the children. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children Come to me, don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. After taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Now, we have seen this before. Mark 9, 38 Uh, The disciples often misuse their authority in granting access to Jesus. And here in verse 13, they try to prevent the little children from coming to see Jesus. Now, if you've grown up in church and heard the story and heard this account before, we often think of the disciples as extremely harsh. and, And I guess they were being rather exclusionary. They felt that children were too insignificant to interrupt the real work of Jesus. Because you see, in this context, at this time, children were not regarded as worthy of honor and priority. They got the leftovers with regard to time. Enter Jesus, and he turns things on their head once again. Jesus rebukes his disciples, verse 14, and he says that, there are, that they are to let the little children come to him. Now that in itself is quite the lesson, and it certainly challenges the status quo of the time. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He seizes the moment and begins to teach his followers once again, this time with the faith of a young child as a metaphor. King Jesus, the Messiah and servant king, the one who is ushering in the kingdom of God, says that this very kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. And so you may be asking, is he saying, is Jesus saying that only young people are important and that only they are going to heaven because they can receive it? No, not at all. But let's pause for a moment and think about how a little child receives something. Let's think about how a little child receives something. They humbly hold up their hands or they ask or they gesture because a little child is dependent on someone else to respond to their needs. A little child is dependent on someone else to respond to their needs. They cannot earn anything. They don't pay. 
They don't work for the things that they receive. A child trusts that what they need will be given to them. And that whatever they ask for in faith will be given to them. They do not doubt. And this, family of God, is how we as followers of Jesus enter the kingdom of God. We do not deserve to enter. We can't earn our entrance. We can't even buy our own ticket. No. We merely receive Jesus and all that he is and all that he has done for us in dying for our sins through faith, through faith and faith alone. There is no other way. There's no other way. The kingdom of God is only for those who come to Jesus in humble dependence and not because of merit. I love how Sally Lloyd-Jones puts Jesus' words here in the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, it's a book that we often give out at our children's dedication to parents for their children. Um, and she writes that Jesus says, no matter how big you grow, this is Jesus now saying, saying this, no matter how big you grow, never grow up so much that you lose your childlike heart full of trust in God. No matter how big you grow, never grow up so much that you lose your childlike heart full of trust in God. Family, there are also very tangible implications for Jesus' followers from these three verses. In verse 16, we can see Jesus' great affection for children. And therefore, we as his followers should follow his example. What time and space do the children in your household capture? Are there various props or add-ons to your status? Are they very much encouraged to be seen and not heard? To perform well, not mess up, and thus earn your love? Are there achievements used to puff you up? Are they there to be bragged about? Are they there to behave and get good marks at school and to not ask you for any help because you're already paying for them to do so much? Are they there to praise you and your achievements? And what about us as a church? Do we prioritize children's discipleship or do we just view it as, a, as child care while the adults do the real church? Here at Roots Fellowship, it is our desire that we as a church would partner with parents to disciple children. I wonder if Jesus' words and actions would cause us to act much like the Christians of the past. According to Levi Baritha, the advocacy and development coordinator at Story International, uh, in ancient Roman Greco times, Christians held what was considered a radical and countercultural view in Rome. And they were widely known for their care for orphan children. In their eyes, in Christians' eyes, every child was made in the image of God and worthy of love, affection, and support. Just as the synagogue communities had done before the coming of Christ, early Christians gave special care and attention to those who were most vulnerable, knowing them to be fearfully and wonderfully made. They were creations of the God of the universe. And so it is clearly true that following the beloved Son of God, following Jesus, influences his followers' attitude to children. It's our prayer that we, that we would develop a desire to care for children. But also from these verses, we can see that we are also to be inspired to believe like them. No matter how big or qualified or experienced or educated or rich we grow, may we never grow up so much that we lose our childlike hearts full of trust in God, full of dependence on Him. You have to love the Gospel of Mark because the writer Mark then emphasizes Jesus' point about the faith of a, of a young children even further as he moves quickly onto the stark contrast of the man written about in the next account, found in verses 17 onwards. And here Jesus now meets a young rich ruler, a man who is very much the opposite approach to that of, a, of a faith, the faith of a young child. Very much the opposite approach to that of the faith of a young child. Verse 17. 
As Jesus was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, how can I be saved? Now, if we were to look at this man through a worldly lens, uh, he has everything. Money, youth, and power. And yet he, like so many, he is still not 100% sure about his eternal position or status with God. This man believes that heaven is the reward for doing the right things because that is how he has acquired all of the other things in his earthly life. And so he comes to Jesus to confirm this idea, this belief. And Jesus once again answers his question with, a question with another question illustrating a point. Jesus says to him, verse 18, Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. In other words, only God can be described as good, and yet this man called Jesus good teacher. But if Jesus was merely a teacher, then he should not have been called good. And if he was indeed good, well, then he was in fact God. And some scholars believe that in Jesus asking this, Jesus is in fact affirming that he is God, whilst others say that Jesus is confronting this rich young man's idea of his own worldly goodness. Ultimately, though, most theologians agree that here, in these verses, Jesus is directing this man's attention to, to the fact that God is the ultimate standard of goodness. And so Jesus says to him, verse 19, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've kept all those from my youth. So here we have this man, in essence, saying, I'm a good guy, and I have flawlessly followed all the rules since I was young. Is this enough for me to get into heaven? Or is there another hurdle for me to jump over, another badge for me to get, another medal for me to earn? You see, he was confused. He thought that he could get into heaven by his own righteous acts. And so what's the next thing that he needs to do? The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3 verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And James writes in, in James 2 verse 10, For whoever keeps the, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And so this man, even though he professes to have kept the law, it is impossible for him to have done so. And so then verse 21, looking at him, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. And said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus lovingly challenges this young man by graciously, graciously challenging the young man's adherence to some of the other commandments that the young ruler had failed to mention earlier on. Namely, you shall have no other gods before me and you shall not make for yourself any idol nor bow, bow down to it or worship it. This young man uh, professed to have followed all the rules, but he had not given God all of his heart. He loved his possessions more than God, and he put his faith and trust in these things over and above God by worshiping the status and power that they gave him. And so Jesus lovingly reveals to this man that he lacked a, a wholehearted trust in God. And Jesus reveals to him by setting him a specific, a very specific task. Sell everything and give it to others. Sell everything and give it to others. The point of this was not an automatic entry into eternal life. Instead, Jesus was lovingly showing this man that it is only by faith in Christ that we can be saved. And not by any works of the law. And so Jesus is not adding to the list of the laws for this man to follow, but as God, Jesus as God, God's one true son, as, as God's son, Jesus knew that this man's love of possessions was preventing him from giving his whole life wholeheartedly to God. And so verse 22, the man was dismayed by this demand and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. You see, family, for this man, the cost of being a disciple of Jesus was too much for him. 
He loved his possessions more than Jesus. And so he wanted to have them both. This man wanted to possess eternal life like he had accumulated so many other things. But instead, Jesus said, follow me and I'll lead you to eternal life. Follow Jesus and he'll lead you to eternal life. Then verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. So does this mean that Jesus is calling you to sell all of your possessions? Well, honestly, family, I do not know. Maybe, maybe not. But what is clear is that following the Messiah King Jesus, following the Messiah King Jesus definitely impacts his followers' approach to material possessions. It has to have an effect on our approach to material possessions. Brothers and sisters, it, you see, it is not possessions that are the problem, but rather it is the love of possessions and material things. Timothy writes, uh, well, Paul writes in, in his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.10, he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Paul goes on to say, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And so family, that's why Jesus says that for many it is so hard to enter the kingdom of God. But Jesus, he's not done there. He goes even further, verses 24 and 25. Mark writes, the disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is saying this, but it's not because the rich own so many things, family, but it's because over time, these material things begin to own them. It's not because the rich own so many things, it's because over time, these things begin to own them. Brother, sister, do you value the things of this world more than you trust in God? Do you value the things of this world more than your desire to follow Jesus? What thing can you absolutely not live without? I ask the question, is it beginning to own you? We then come to our last five verses for today. Verse 26, they, the disciples, were even more astonished, saying to one another, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? You see, the disciples were amazed because to them, wealth and easy living automatically equaled God's favor and his reward and his blessing for right religious living. And church, if we're honest, this is still an erroneous belief taught and preached in many churches and cultures today. But here we have Jesus teaching that it is impossible for anyone who solely trusts, who solely trusts in their material wealth to enter into eternal life. You see, family, it's not what's reflected in our bank balances that reveals our heart's priorities. Both the poor and the rich can value their possessions more than they value God. And so the disciples ask, then ask, so who can be saved? Who can be saved? And in verse 27, Jesus responds with the gospel. He responds with the gospel. Verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, With man it is impossible, but with God, because all things are possible with God. With man it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. Jesus saying that it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God by one's own effort, much like he did a few verses back. The author of Ephesians affirms this when he writes Ephesians 2 verse 8, For grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. If you aren't a Christian and you're listening to this, friend, this is the gospel. It is by grace that Christians have been saved through our faith in Jesus Christ's perfect virgin birth, His perfect sinless life, His perfect ransom, death on a cross, His resurrection, and His ascension into heaven. We cannot earn our salvation. And here in verse 27, Jesus tells his disciples this. And so just then, as he tells them this, Peter seems to have misunderstood what what he said, what Jesus has said. And and so Peter seizes the opportunity to make a claim for, for the disciples' impressive track record, right? Clearly, they're not like the rich young ruler. 
Verse 28, Peter began to tell him, look, we have left everything and followed you. We're not like the, the rich young ruler. As if Peter needed to remind Jesus of what him and the other disciples had given up and how their track record compares uh, uh, to the rich young rulers. But Jesus is not indebted to Peter or any of the disciples because of what they have given up. Verse 29, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. Jesus assures his disciples that anyone who gives up anything valuable for Jesus' sake will receive 100 times over in this life, although not necessarily in the exact same form. For example, many may be rejected by their family for accepting Christ, but they will gain the larger family of believers or the church. And so Jesus lets the disciples know that along with these blessings, his followers will also experience persecutions in this world as well. Because this world, family, this world hates God. Jesus emphasizes the cost of following him so that people who only follow him for the rewards will be revealed. They will be revealed. But oh, how the rewards far outweigh the cost. And so Jesus also assures those who genuinely, genuinely love and follow him that they will gain eternal life along with all things as heirs with Christ. How good is God, family? Those who put their faith and trust in him would be co-heirs with Christ. At the same time, family, we need to be prepared to be rejected and persecuted by this world as we prepare to be accepted into God's kingdom. Jesus then closes out with this verse in 31, verse 31. But many who are first will be lost, and the last first. Many who are first will be lost, and the last first. Jesus lets the disciples know that in the world to come, the values of the world we are living in will be reversed. In the world to come, the values of the world we are living in will be reversed. Those who seek status, fame, and importance above everything else will have none of that in heaven whilst those who are humble here will be great in heaven. And so family, we as followers of Jesus need to let our servant king's teaching here in these verses, and indeed our entire text for today, we need to let them alter the way we view and seek power and status in this world. Brother and sister, what are you chasing after at home and at work? What are you seeking to achieve with all of those qualifications and by working those long, long hours? What are you seeking to gain on social media? Now, of course, as we saw earlier, these things in and of themselves are not bad. And in fact, they can be incredibly useful in the kingdom of God. But when we make them Lord over our lives, when power, status, likes, and influence is all that we're living for, then we need to heed Jesus' words. The first will be lost and the last will be first. Family, Jesus is the beloved Son of God and the true Messiah and servant King. He was the King no one expected, but He was the Savior we so desperately needed. He was the King no one expected, but He was the Savior we so desperately needed. But who Jesus is, family, has implications for His followers. We have seen today that following Jesus affects his followers' view of marriage. It influences our attitude towards children. It has implications for how we view material possessions. And finally, it alters our approach to position, status, and standing. And so family, as we go out to be the church scattered, God's salt and light this week. I pray that His Holy Spirit would indeed remind us of this. And that as we engage with the world at home, at work, at school, and at play, that the kingdom of God would shine brightly through us 
and into all of the places and spaces where we are. And it is our prayer that all of this is for our goodness and for His ultimate glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You sent Your Son, Jesus, Your beloved Son, into this world as the Messiah and Servant King. We thank You that from Your Word today we've seen that He came to serve and not to be served. And that as the Servant King went about and, and saved us, Lord God, that that has implications for those who would profess their love and faith in Jesus. And it would have an effect on how we live out our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower us this week and beyond to go out and be your salt and light, to be your church. And Lord God, that, that we would let this message really affect our hearts, change our hearts, change our, our views where we need to, Lord God. Help us to get on to, to your way of doing things, Lord God. We surrender to you our ways. Lord God, it is clear that, that we, we, as your people, need to view marriage in the highest regard. That we need to be affectionate and show love and, and care for your children, Lord God. That we need to see the things that we are accumulating on this earth differently. That we need to remember that we are storing up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. And Lord God, we pray that you would especially change our view on status and power and standing in this world, and that we would come to serve those around us as you served us in dying on a cross for our sins. We cannot thank you enough. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, and in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Today marks the start of our in-person gatherings for 2021. So while some of you are watching here, others are gathered at church. The same will happen next week on Sunday the 28th. Um, but in order to attend, you have to book on the Godu Church app. These bookings will be open from tomorrow, that's Monday the 22nd. Please, please do book. All COVID protocols are going to be followed. And as usual, we would encourage you to like, subscribe, share, and keep up with what we are up to. Uh, and finally, we will close our gathering with a benediction as we do always. Today's benediction is from Revelations 22, verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen.